Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Swordfish Bait Presentations. I'm going to be talking with Captain Jackson David of Intercoastal Angler out of the Wrightsville Beach, Wilmington area. We're going to be covering such areas as terminal tackle, bait rigging, and the effectiveness of a well-rigged bait. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools. And here in our latest and greatest effort, the Saltwater Podcast Series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their, their insights, their thoughts on how to catch more fish more often. In this endeavor, I am joined by Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Hey, Billy. Welcome to another episode. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, man. Always good to be in the podcast chair, especially when you got Jackson David on the other end getting ready to talk about sword fishing. Like That's pretty dope. And he's so. prepared. I know you saw what I saw. Yeah. He's got a table laid out with all the goodies. So this is not going to be just a discussion. This is going to be a presentation slash discussion. Yeah, man. It's going to be good. Hopefully, Gary, you can keep up. It's on my whole wish. Just it. I mean, we are not in my comfort zone, but I am curious. Like a lot of people, I am curious yeah. about catching a swordfish off North Carolina. So I will definitely be paying attention. Yeah, man. It's going to be awesome. And so to get the show kicked off, we want to thank our sponsors as we typically always do. So we got Marine Warehouse Center. I get a quick message from them and we'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything from trailer, trailer parts, engines, engine parts, new boats, boat parts, a full store. We have a service department. We are your one-stop shop for marine equipment and hardware. We offer a wide variety of parts and accessories for all your marine needs. The best part about working at Marine Warehouse Center is to help customers really get the most out of their coastal lifestyle and share our love for the water. At Marine Warehouse, we're here to get you out on the water because of our love for the water. We like being out there and we want you out there with us. All right, man. There they go. They're doing it. They are, man. They take care of me. They take care of the Fisherman's Post boat. And after the holidays, I keep the boat through the holidays. But then but then they get it, man. And I got a little laundry list going, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, Gary, speaking of holidays, as we've been doing this little segment called Where in the World is Emmett, Emmett also is excited about the holidays, and he has been per, per, um, participating, there's the word, in some holiday functions. So this is one... I don't really have any good hints for you. Um, I was going to do some history about this thing. Let's just say multiple cars are involved. Any t any any guesses as to where Emmett was spotted? Holiday and multiple cars involved? Yeah. Um, Thanksgiving Day Parade? He He's in a parade. That's right, man. You're, you're pretty good at this. Uh, but it's not Thanksgiving Day. That looks like a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory Parade. Not sure what's <laughs> going on there. There's some Oompa Loompas for sure. And he's riding shotgun, <laughs> always looking at the camera, very, uh, very camera ready. So, man, that guy can sniff out a camera, man. He's always smiling for the camera, man. <laughs> always looking for the camera. And uh, I'm not really sure why he sponsors the show after we spoke fun at him, but I love those guys, man. Super amounts of fun. So, um, and I do think that Marine Warehouse does participate in some holiday parades and things throughout the end of the year. I'm pretty sure I've seen him in a Christmas parade around town a few times. And I just know that they are active in the community beyond, you know, certainly the re reach of Fisherman's Post. I know Early Gardens and, you know, a number of a yeah. number of elements. I mean, they, they are certainly part of the community and not just the fishing boating community, but the community itself, man. Again, I'm fans. And, you know, as we plug, you know, sales, service or parts, man, they got you. They, they, they got want it. a relationship. So go buy your loved one a boat for Christmas. Can't think of a better gift. Yeah. And you can ship it to them as well. They ship all over the place. I want to remind people of that as well. So, all right, man. Well, speaking of boats, speaking of fishing, I got a fish photo for you. Are you ready? Yeah, man. Here we go. We got Keith Harabin with a 26 inch gag grouper that was caught on a Spanish sardine while fishing 14 miles off of Wrightsville Beach. That's a good looking fish, Gary. What do you think? 26 inches? Is that true? Yeah, I'm not gonna call. I'm not gonna call that. I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm in. I buy it. I believe Keith either was or still is a seato captain and i've got a soft spot in my heart for seato so i'm just going to take him at face value i would have a softer spot if their logo was right here 
You hear I me, know Scott. you would. You mentioned that anytime <laughs> I bring up Cito. Where's the logo? I don't see it. Let's make fun of this guy. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> thanks for submitting the picture. And be sure that you guys submit your photos to the Fisherman's Post, not only for the podcast, but for other things as well, publications, tournaments, Gary's pleasure. He has all these walls in his rooms, his offices. His wife is going to kill him if he puts one more photo up. But you love him, man. He's, he's like a photo junkie. That's why he has his newspaper. Mm-hmm. I never get tired of seeing a fish photo. We'd love to have them come in all day, every day. That's it, man. And if you don't know how to catch a fish, you can learn. We got some pretty cool stuff happening with our membership. Gary, you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I'll do a quick plug. You know, while we did weekly fishing reports over the summer, or more specifically from April through October, from November to March, we've got a bi-weekly fishing schedule because the fishing does slow down, so it just doesn't make as much sense to go weekly. But to continue to give value to our members, those that have signed up for the service, we're offering several live shows. So those live shows are similar to the podcast. However, you know, we're going to have multiple captains on the screen at the same time. They're going to be sharing their different views of how to do certain winter topics, um, trout, red drum, black drum, near shore bottom. And, you know, the part that I think we're most excited about that they're not only are they live shows, which add a little bit of energy to them, but you can text in, chat in, call in with questions, and then your questions will be asked to the captain. So if you think I don't do that good of a job, if there's questions you wish I would ask, if you've been thinking that, like, here's your opportunity, man. You can sign up. It's cheap, 10 bucks a month, 100 bucks for a year. And, you know, those prices are likely to go up in 2023. So now is a good time, you know, get in, get locked in. Um, before any kind of price range and live shows, bi-weekly reports, and then you're set up for weekly come April. Heck yeah, man. Well, I'm excited, dude. I'm excited about uh, to do those live shows, first of all, because they're so much fun. So I know um, those people are going to ask better questions than you. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. <laughs> no, I hope so. I hope I'm, <laughs> I hope you and the guests are asking all the questions and I am just a bad joke, right? s- smart comment making guy. Yeah, dude, I don't know. Maybe I'll ask a question or two, but I don't think that I'll I'll be doing that. But anyway, I'm gonna let you and I'm gonna let you and Jackson get to it, man. I'm excited about the sword fishing conversation. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna let you guys chop it up about so okay, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> That's sad I had that laying around for that. Okay, anyhow. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is the you just made the podcast you took pressure off of jackson there we go you can't get any worse than that so but, but yeah man it's my pleasure to welcome jackson back to the podcast man he did swordfish last year it was a big hit and we both talked afterwards knowing he could go into a lot more detail on several of the topics and that's what he's here tonight um about bait presentation captain jackson david intercoastal angler wrightsville beach wilmington area welcome back to the podcast man pleasure to have you return Gary, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Well, yeah, man. So since you're a returning guest, you know the deal. There's two questions. And the first question you've heard before, but I'm going to make you answer it again. Why should we listen to anything you have to say about a swordfish, Captain Jackson? Man, um, as I've told y'all before, Gary, swordfish is you know, near and dear to our heart. We've been after these things for going on six or seven years now. And we absolutely love it. We eat it up. We've caught a bunch of them. We've lost a bunch of them. But, you know, every failure is a, a learning opportunity. So it keeps us coming back, chasing one a little bit bigger, a little bit meaner. So hear us out. We've got a lot of cool things to say. A lot of the things that we've done and learned were wrong. We've corrected. And so it's really cool to be able to share with you guys all the things that we've, you know, improved and made right to be able to catch these crazy fish. Man, and I know that people appreciate it because swordfish has been typically one of those species that people will keep under their hat or reluctant to share. So the fact that you're willing to help people out and, you know, as an avenue, intercoastal angler. So it's not just Jackson David. I'll go ahead and give intercoastal angler a plug here too. you know, visit that store because they will follow up on anything that Jackson's talked about, put stuff in your hand, show you what they've been talking about in the podcast. Um, So, yeah, man, I knew you were going to pass question number one. So I got question number two. As tradition goes, a non-fishing related question. You tell me ready, I give you question number two. I'm ready, let's hear it. All right, I have questions for you, not about swordfish, but about swords. You know, similar, I guess, to the gag that Billy pulled out. Question number one, what do you call a sword only used by women? Mm. Now I'm gonna defer to you. You got to, to give me the answer on that one. That would be a broad sword. You use a, they use a broad sword, ha 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 ha. 
All right. That's pretty Question good. number That's two, good. also about a sword. What is the difference between Bill Cosby and a tiny fencing sword? A tiny fencing sword. You got me. The difference there. between Bill Cosby and a tiny fencing sword. I got nothing. You got to give it to me. I can't. I can't think of anything. Well, one of them would be a little rapier. <laughs> oh, those are good. Those are good. Where did you find those at on Google? The internet. Where do you find all bad jokes? The internet. All right. Enough good. of bad jokes. Let's get right to it because I think I love again your setup. I love your approach to you know display this. So we're going to terminal tackle first, correct? Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll jump right into it a little bit. I'm going to tilt the screen down just a hair so you can see it a little bit better. So I've got a little bit of the terminal tackle here laid out, and I'll, um, I'll pick it up as I show it to you because it's kind of hard to see. But the main thing we start with is the, is the guts of it, the meat of it, and that's going to be your leader. Um, over the past years, we've tried a bunch of different things. Uh, changed a bunch of sizes and we've kind of settled with this Gene Kai 300 pound. It's been really effective for us. Gene Kai is a little bit, I don't want to say a little bit flimsier, but it's, it has a little bit more stretch to it than Bill Fisher or some of the other brands. And we like that, man. It gives it a little bit of give, a little bit of shock absorption. So that's that's kind of why we stuck with Gene Kai. We fished it, you know, in all avenues of our fishing. So kind of adapted well to doing this and 300 pound has been, been on the money. Haven't broke any fish off because of that. Um, so again, that Gene Kai 300, Great bite leader. Um, I think we talked about, you know, when we talked sword fishing last time, we're still at the 200 on our wind on and everything. But once you get past the swivel to the bite leader, we're always up to 300. Um, so okay. it's been a great leader. And that's that's what we kind of stick with for that. Um, next part is for your, you know, all the things I've got laid out here. You're going to need your 1.9 crimp. Um, the bill fishers do really well for us. So that 1.9 fits the 300 great. Uh, and you need that to make your tight connection so you don't have a, have a crotch break on them. Um, then we kind of move up the leader a little bit and then I'll get back to the hooks, but we keep a swivel at the top of them to keep anything from tangling up where it connects, you know, from your wind on to your, what we call your bite leader, which is that 300 pound, but you can use anything, man. We like to stick with a 200 pound ball bearing. You can even go to a 250. Um, we're really not putting a crazy amount of heat on these fish. Uh, I know you can't see my face talking about this, but I'm trying to let you get a look at everything I got laid out. So, like I said, you can you can go up from the 200. You know, we like to stay right around that range. It's a little bit stealthier, and we're not putting a ton of heat on these fish. So, stay right with a 200-pound, you know, spray ball bearing. That does great for us, and we've had really good success with it. Um, moving down into the bait, we like fishing that, uh, that 7691 SS by Mustad. It's been a really strong hook, stainless steel hook. Um, got a big enough gap, you know, grab some meat when it gets a hold of those fish. You know, they got super soft mouths. Um, so it's really been a good hook for us, really effective. It does not have a welded eye, which is the only thing I would change about it. But I do like that hook a lot. It's been really effective for us, and that's what we're fishing in all our baits. Um, other things that you're going to need doing the rigging process. Uh, we've got some of Jody's at Blue Water Candy, his floss. That's 70 pound, just regular old wax rigging floss. He's done really good with this stuff, and we've had really good success with it. Um, I know everybody sees the red and automatically thinks that means something something special, but not so much. I mean, I, I like the red just simply because you can see it, and it makes the stitching look pretty. So for it's more of an aesthetic thing for me. Um, so you need that. You need a mortician's needle. Uh, we sell those at the shop. We sell all of this at the shop. Um, but a mortician's needle is essential. You want a good sharp one, you know, to be able to get through that bait and be able to uh, be able to get your stitching right. Um, last two things that you need for rigging. We really only need one of them, but the light, I know we talked about last time, um, both those Jura lights, the diamond makes, those things are really nice. Um, I've got one here in a blue and a green, you know, those are, those have typically been really good colors for us. Um, that blue penetrates the darkness really well and it's pitch black dark down there. So blue light helps a lot. That's a really important, um, last but not least is the skirt selection. Now, you ask six different people, you get six different answers. Um, you could probably put any kind of skirt down there and get a bite. I mean, you know, I like this darker this darker skirt. Just if you think trout fishing, and for example, and you're fishing at night, you know, a lot of those guys are fishing a darker pattern bait. It offers that silhouette, and uh, and they really get a better profile view of it. So we usually stick with a darker skirt. We'll throw some glow stuff in there too. Um, everything down there has a lot of bioluminescence, you know, in it. So everything in that part of the ocean is is glowing at some point or another 
um, whether it be, you know, little tentacles or things hanging off of their head, everything's glowing. So we stay with this darker pattern, throw a little bit of glow in there. This is a Fathom OC50, um, which is a really good size skirt for, you know, what I've got here to show you guys, which is a, a dolphin belly. Um, so it fits over that really nice. And I'll show you that here in a minute when we get into rigging it. But as far as terminal tackle, man, that's pretty much, you know, that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of it. Things that we use every day. You know, we've rigged hundreds of these things and uh, we've gotten better at it. I can promise you the first ones don't look as good as the last ones do. I'll say that. Hey, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Yeah, get right ahead, Gary. So you've, through trial and error, you've decided on blue and green as sort of the best light to put on this rig? We do. We like the blue and green skirt. I mean, the blue and green lights a lot. Um, we did a lot of research on lighting. And again, this is such a such a new sport and such a new thing that people are doing. You ask 20 different people or ask six different people, you're going to get six different answers. You know, it's it's a very... It's a very opinionated thing. Some guys are stuck in their ways on what they like, and, you know, we're stuck with what we like. So we've always been blue and green. Probably not going to change it unless uh, unless we start getting beat by somebody or start not catching them, one of the two. In, in your opinion, and only your opinion, what would be a color to absolutely stay away from? I don't think that there's necessarily a color to stay away from. I think that that's a, you know, that's a, that's a personal preference. I know that they make a red light. Um, and somebody that's going to watch this is going to be like, oh, man, the red light's my favorite color. Um, but I, I haven't fished a red light very much, and that may be why I don't like it as much. Um, so I would say if I had to choose one, it would be a red light. But it's it's so, like I said, it's so opinionated. You get so many different thoughts on it. But it's because there's there's very few of us out there doing it. So very few guys are getting that, you know, that research um, out there seeing those fish getting caught. So that's just our personal okay. opinion. Then I have one other question. I hope this isn't a dumb question because, again, we are out of my comfort zone. On the Fathom skirt, did you say mm -hmm. that you add glow to the skirt or you like to buy skirts with glow added in already? No, we'll add some in with glow already on them. Um, and I showed you that one right there. This You can't really see it that good behind my black sweatshirt. But that's a black skirt with a red vein in it. Um, and like I was saying, you know, if you think, think inshore fishing, I try to correlate everything back to another type of fishing because at the end of the day, they are all fish. Um, you want something with a darker pattern to it because it gives off that silhouette in the darkness, especially when that light beams one time. Those lights are a lot brighter than you think, and their eyes are so gigantic that they're picking up every little pixel of light that could be potential food. You know, as in us, where we're seeing cars go down the road and we know it's a car, to them, if they see a light flash, they assume food or a threat. So either one of those things, they're they're very curious animals, and so we try to add as much to it as we can, get as big a profile, not necessarily as big a profile, but as defined of a profile and an action out of a bait as we possibly can. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm just not getting it. So are you adding glow? Is that an aftermarket addition? I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question correctly. Um, No, they make these skirts with glow in them. So okay. this one, we're actually out of them at the shop. That's why I've got this one with the red vein in it. But they'll make them with veins of, you know, any kind of glow you want. So you can get a whole glow skirt. Like I've got one over here beside me that I rigged uh, rigged earlier that's a fully glow skirt. You can get some with just, you know, a black body and a uh, glow vein. I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff. And those guys are, you know, a huge help. So anybody that has any questions about that, you know, you can come talk to us and we can order it for you or you can go see them either way. And I, I know you said the model number of that skirt, but what would you describe that as? Like an eight inch skirt? Is that roughly right? or? trying to think because i always just know it as an oc50 um it's it's the middle size so if you look in okay. if you look at the shelf there's a little bitty one and there's one above it then there's the oc50 and then there's an oc70 i think it is which is the jumbo jumbo okay that that uh, uh exhausts my questions man i'm ready to follow the new topic now no you're good man well with all that being said um jump right into the rigging and the bait which is really it's an art form, and I, in a way, before we started this, I'm going to tilt my screen down. In a way, before we started this, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking, I was like, man, this is like a cooking show. And I was like, started thinking about it. I was like, you know, it is, in a way, you're baking a cake. And if you don't have all the right ingredients and do all the right things, then your cake comes out either leaning to one side or not tasting very good. So, in a way, it is like a cooking show, but the easiest way to describe everything is like this. A dolphin belly, which is what I've got right here in front of me, is probably one of your easiest and most used swordfish baits, you know, that you'll see anywhere. 
And there's a thousand different ones, you know, that I'll go into a little bit later on. But easiest bait, most effective, sturdiest, I would say is probably your dolphin bait. So when you go to, this is just cut off the side of him here. And this one we've had in the freezer for a while, so she doesn't look as pretty. Um, but when you go to clean your dolphin at the end of the day, you want to come right down there behind his, I guess it's his two fins that sit under his chin, not his peck fins. But I guess you could call them some kind of peck fin. Anyway, you start right behind that and you want to trim all the way down past his anal fin. And what you're doing is you're making this sturdy end down here so that it can swim not only, but then when he grabs a hold of it, you know, it doesn't tear into shreds like something soft would. It's got some substance to it, which we really like a lot. So you'll end up with that, uh, with that pretty strip like that. And you can open it up because all this is is belly cavity inside right here. So that is that allows for where your bait's gonna or where your hook's gonna sit, and then you stitch everything. You know, end up looking just almost like a baseball glove when you get done stitching it up. Holds all that together, keeps your hook inside, and makes just a really streamlined, you know, pretty bait to send down there to the bottom when it's sixteen hundred feet and you got to get it all the way there. But getting into it though, as far as the rigging process, take my hook here. I usually lay my hook up and measure it up in the front of him and then get my needle out. So all I did here was flip my hook upside down. I inverted it inside the belly. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. But the hook is inverted inside the belly. And what I like to do is I'm just measuring everything out right here. So I lay my hook in there, eyeball it out. I want the eye of my hook as close to the front of that bait. Let's see if we can see it a little bit better. As close to the front of that bait as I can get it. For two reasons. One, it gets my hook sitting better in the back. It doesn't have it all, you know, bound up like a worm when you're bass fishing. Second reason is it doesn't let it, it'll catch that hard spot in the front of the belly right there and it won't let your hook pull through when he grabs it. So those two reasons we get it as close to the front as we possibly can without being out of it. So then I'll take my needle and I'll come right here to the bend of the hook. If you guys can see that. I'm right here at the bend of the hook. I'll stick my needle through the belly and then you can pull the hook away. So basically all I've done right here is stick that needle through where that hook had marked. See all that, Gary? Yep, I follow completely, man. You're doing great. Perfect. So now I've got a hole, I've got a marker hole right here. So I can take my needle out at that point, and then I'll get my hook back. I'll go back to where I marked my hole right there. I'll run my run my uh, run my hook through there, punch it through the belly, and then you rigged it just like a worm. Your yep. hook's left at the bottom of it, and you're ready to put your line on there to be able to connect it all. Now, one of the most important parts, and I'll talk a little bit more about hook placement in your bait later when we get to that, but one of the most important parts is to make sure that the, your hook comes through dead center of that belly, whether it be bonitas, whether it be you know wahoos, dolphins, any of that stuff. You want to make sure it comes right through the center for two reasons. If you think about it, when you're wahoo fishing or dolphin fishing or tuna fishing, you're using a ballyhoo that has a chin weight in it. And that chin weight is acting as a keel to keep that bait from spinning or riding on its side or not seeming natural to the you know, predatory fish that you're trying to catch. Same thing with the swordfish bait, except the hook is your keel. You don't have a weight in it, so the hook acts as what's keeping your bait upright. So if you offset that hook, so if I jab that hook through one side, or even if I was off a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch, that bait would want to ride on its side and it, not and it would not present itself naturally, which is really important. You know, you think about it, even though it's dark, they pick up on that stuff. If something's swimming on its side, it'd be like your mirror lure and be tangled around your leader. You know, mirror lure doesn't swim right, you don't get any trout bites. Swordfish bait doesn't swim right, you don't get any swordfish bites. So that's really important. I'd say as far as punching your hook, that's probably the most important thing to do. Now, as far as attaching your leader, y'all have noticed I haven't put anything on here yet as far as I mean, my 300 pound. I've got my space marked right up here at the front too. So now my hook's laying inside the belly, just like we had talked about. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my needle back out, and I'm gonna punch that needle right back through his right back through his head right here. Spin it to me so I can see it for a second. But I'm gonna punch it right through the front of his head. And that's gonna that's gonna open up a hole for my leader. So now I've got that, and I kind of hold onto that, pinch it, look at it, make sure everything looks like it where I want it to. Keep my hole in between the eye, because this is another crucial part. If it doesn't work out here, you're gonna pull that crimp right through that, um, right through that bait. I'm looking, there it is right there. So what I'll do is take your leader, take your 300 pound like that, run it through the eye, 
and then through the bait. So if that makes sense, and you can see all that now, yeah, you see that. Yep. Now that thing is connected through there. So anytime he pulls on it or anything pulls on it, it's pulling on the line, the bait, and the hook. It's all as one right there. So then you want to get everything laid out, pull you a little bit of slack through there. And I cut a short piece this time. Usually we're using about six foot. Uh, we want it as long, you know, as a big one's bill. We don't want it, uh, we don't want him to get on the 200 pound because it'll chafe you off on that one, I feel like. Side your crimp on. Then you take your crimp, run it right in there just like you would any other, any other type of lure. Slide that down. And what you're doing is just pulling everything back together there. And slide your hook into place. I'm trying to do this and talk at the same time. Gary, if you have any questions while I'm doing this, by the way, feel free. Okay, man, I will, but I'm I'm following everything. I mean, you're, uh, this uh, demonstration is working great, man. I'm following everything. Makes sense. All makes sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so then you're left with, you're left with a belly, hook inside of it. Get your hook straightened out. And then you've got a little loop up here at the front. So your little loop at the front, you can leave. You don't have to cinch that thing super tight for a couple reasons. Um, first one, you don't want to bind your bait up. Second one is you want to be able to have your skirt almost pulled down on top of that crimp whenever we put the skirt on later. So it's really important okay. that you leave that little bit of loop right there before you crimp it. And then once you got it all squared away, you can hit it with the crimpers. I'm not going to crimp it just for the sake of time. But hit it with your crimpers, close everything off. And then I spin my bait back over, and that's when this is when my favorite part starts. This is the stitching. So, like I said earlier, we use that 70 pound floss that Blue Water Candy makes, and you pull you out. I usually pull me about about six foot of it. You always want way more than what you're expecting, because there is absolutely nothing worse than putting in all this effort for a 30 minute bait and running out of floss halfway back up it, because then you got to start all over again. And that's not what you want. So all I did was attach my uh, attach the end of my floss to my mortician needle. I just tie a little overhand knot. You know, you ask ask different people, they attach it different ways. And heck, man, you can. There's 30 different ways to rig this bait right here. So I know somebody's watching. Like, well, this isn't what I saw. Well, it works for us. You know, if you want to try it, it's super simple, super easy, and um, it makes it fun to get fishing. But getting into the flosses, I've got my floss attached to my needle. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, if y'all can all see that, Gary, get a good look at that there. Yeah, man, I'm following. It's right there. Perfect. So I'm going to start at the very top corner of it right here. Make sure that you don't get too close to the edge of the skin because you'll tear through it when you go to pull your cinch tight. But I start there, and I'm going to poke all the way through both the sides of those, uh, both sides of that belly cap. You see how it caught both sides of it right there? Yep. Do that. Pull your needle through. Pull your floss all the way down. And I usually leave, you know, five, six, seven inches on the end so I can tie my finishing knot when I come back to it. So an important part of doing this is to um, is to make sure your floss doesn't get in your way. Because that floss, you got five or six feet of it out there, it can be a pain sometimes. But I go about, I don't know, a half inch down to bait and I do the same thing. I'll punch it through both sides. And you want to make sure your sides are even, you know, otherwise you'll have a you'll have a bait that's got a big lip on one side and you know it's flat on the other side. So you want to make sure when you go through there, you go through both sides at the same time. But you'll pull that all the way through, and that starts making your stitching pattern going down. And I always readjust my bait a little bit, look at it, make sure everything's lined up, and then I'll get right back to it. Move down, stab through, pull your floss through if I can do it without tearing my counter up. Pull your floss through, and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to start that, going to start that pretty rigging stitch right there. And this is the same thing if you guys have ever, you know, stitched a, uh, stitched a Spanish mackerel, you know, blue marlin fishing, or um, or a mullet, you know, anything for a teaser bait, blue marlin fishing. It's the same exact stitching pattern. It's just uh, we just use it in a, you know, we're using it in a little bit different application, but same exact concept. So as you're stitching, I'm going to ask, when you go out, how many baits have you rigged? So how many do you have on the boat? I'm a little embarrassed to say this because we spend way too much time thinking about these things. Um, but I'd say in the freezer downstairs, we've got anywhere from 50 to 60. Um, and it done just like this, you know, every single one of them, 
it's been a lot of long process, but um, we'll carry anywhere between, you know, eight and nine baits usually in a day. Um, you know, expecting the best, but I don't, doesn't always work out like that. We vacuum seal everything. So we're prepped and ready to go, you know, the day weeks before we get ready to get a weather window. So, so yeah. you'll vacuum seal this bait. This isn't like rig it in the morning and then take it out that day or rig it the night yeah. before. No, I don't mean yeah. the morning. Absolutely not. No, we've, we've been prepped for these things for you know, months in advance so that when the day finally does show up, we don't have to spend two hours rigging a dozen baits to be able to go the next day. So, okay. We got a lot of, a lot of prep work in behind it, but for the sake of time, I know we don't have all night and I could sit here all night talking to you. Yeah. What I would do is keep going. You see how there's still open flat back here in the back of that yeah. bait. You want to keep making that same stitch pattern all the way down until you close that flap. And what that does is it seals that bait up so that, you know, when water hits it, you're dropping that weight so fast, it doesn't open that bait back up and tear your stitching out. But for the sake of time, I'm going to turn around and show you one stitch going the other way. And then we'll, uh, I've got a finished one over here that I did earlier. I'll show you. Now, if you notice, whenever I stick my needle back through, all I did was come around and stick it right back through the front hole. My last, next to last stitch there. And I'm going to pull that thing back through there. Yeah, and so after you've made your first stitch, coming back up right here, you'll see that pretty X pattern starting across the back of the dolphin belly right there. All yeah. you're going to do is pull those tight, make sure everything's clean there, and then continue the same thing. You're just basically going back through the holes that you've already made. And I like to make sure I use the same hole going back up the bait because it keeps from puncturing another part of that, of that dolphin belly, which is really sure. important. Um, Makes sense. As far as washing out and being a problem. But you can see that X pattern starting, and I'll show you. Like I said, for the sake of time, I've got a fresh one done right here from earlier. That's the final product. So you end up with that beautiful stitching on there, which I think is really cool. And it is, you know, it's like cooking, man. I mean, you, you, you've got a recipe, and you're trying to perfect it, and this is pieces of the puzzle in my eyes. But that's a finished bait. Once you get your stitching all the way back up here to the front, you know, you'll go back through your last stitch there, and then it's a super simple overhand knot. Pull that overhand knot tight, clip the tag, and that's all there is to it. And then you're good to go. The bait's attached. You know, you can pull on it. Hook doesn't move. Hook doesn't bind. It just makes a super sturdy, super streamlined bait, and you're ready to make a drop after you put the skirt on there. Um, and that's my next thing is getting that skirt on there is important too because that thing is traveling at such a high rate of speed. If you don't attach the skirt to the bait, you'll end up having your skirt 30 feet above your bait and it's not serving any purpose. So after you've gotten everything done, rigging as far as stitching, you get your skirt out and I've got a full one that I had with me that I'll show you because I've cut this one. But remember that one right there that I showed you earlier, that's that full length OC50. Now I don't want all those tentacles for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's gonna cover up the majority of my bait. You're not gonna get to see the action of it. Number two, I don't want any of those tentacles to get hung on any part of the hook. Because if they do, when he's down there thrashing and eating it, then I'm, I'm never going to get a good hook set. I'm going to pull my fish off, and it's going to be an issue. So same thing, same skirt, both OC50s. This is a glow skirt, black with a red vein. I chop some tentacles off here, and then I'll slide that skirt, poke a little hole in the front of him there, slide the skirt all the way down, and then kind of open, open his body up there. And you can wiggle that thing right down there through. That makes sense? Yeah, man, it's going to get caught on the crimp. Yep, and it's going to get caught on the crimp, but I'm going to punch the crimp through there. So I'll twist him, and all I'm doing is forcing that forcing that dolphin belly, you know, up inside of it. See how that crimp pulls right through the top of him, and you're left with a bullet. So that skirt at the top is trapped between the skirt, I mean the crimp and the dolphin belly. So that's going to keep it from riding back up and it's going to just keep it in that, in that zone. Yep, it sure will. And I'm, I take one more, you know, one more additive to make sure it doesn't come back up. I'll get my needle back out. I've lost it for some reason. Um, but I'll get my needle back out and run one right through the head of the skirt and through the dolphin belly. And that attaches him to the, uh, attaches him permanently to the skirt so even if it you know somehow slipped over that skirt like that you know the crimp slipped over the skirt i've still got him hooked i've still got that skirt attached so i'll take my needle i've got just a little short piece of floss 
take my needle, jam it right through his head. I can get it to go through there. Yep, right through his head and through the skirt, out the back side. Pull that. Cut my needle away. And then I'll take it. Got two tags. Make one overhand knot that I was talking about earlier. Same knot you're using on the end of your bait there. And then you'll pull that thing down just like that. It'll cinch to his head. Trim your tags. And get it to cut. And that's it. So now your bait is attached as one with your skirt. So you've got that real pretty streamlined bait. And as the floss is through his head, you know, the skirt, we learned that the hard way. The skirt came riding all the way up to, you know, when we were in the infant stages of this. Um, the skirt came riding all the way up the front of that, uh, front of the leader. And it gets in your way, man. It's, it's not, not good for your fishing, not good for hooking your fish. So it's really important to have that, have that skirt attached to it right there. And then you're trimming the skirt so that, I mean, the goal isn't, it's still beyond the hook, but it's just not showing, it's showing a good part of the tail so you can see action. But since it's not as long, even though it goes past the hook, the risk of snagging the hook goes down because you've trimmed it. Correct. Correct. Okay. And, and we'll even take it, you know, on the belly side there, sometimes we'll pull a couple of those tentacles away and cut them all the way back up to the top of the skirt, you know, just so you don't have to worry about that thing catching on the hook point. Cause that's, that's disaster. You know, you're never going to get a good hook. And the worst thing that could happen is, you know, that fish comes swimming up, you know, as fast as he can rise the skirt all the way up, or if it's hooked on there, you don't have a good hook. And then you end up pulling off a nice fish, which we've seen it and it sucks. So I'm trying to, trying to prevent that from anybody that wants to rig on the bait. Well, man, I'm, I think you did a great, I love your preparation and I love that you had like one already tied up or threaded knitted. And, no. uh, yeah, man, I think you made that process very easy. I like the analogy to baking a cake. I mean, everything is good. And, um, I guess we're going to finish with, what was it? Like just talking about the characteristics of a well-rigged bait, the value. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the whole end point. You want to see it in action, you know, so you, it comes down to how that bait swims. Um, and if you do everything, you know, with the hook centered as it's keel weight, it's going to allow that bait to have natural action. You know, the tail of that dolphin belly will swim really well. Um, and it just adds for, you know, get more bites and then a higher hookup to kill ratio. You know, not as many fish just down there beating around on it, messing with it. So it makes a, makes a big difference to have a well, you know, well prepared bait that's going to fish correctly. Um, and then the sturdiest, you know, the sturdiness of it is a huge factor too. We play that into all of our baits, you know, whether we're rigging dolphin bellies, bonita sides, you know, any kind of belly works great because of how sturdy it is, but your stitching is super important. You want to make sure that your stitching's tight enough, you know, that it's not binding and picking that bait apart, but also not so loose that when he grabs a hold of it, he rips the stitching out of it and your bait's down there spinning. You don't ever get a second bite out of it. Man, uh, on the... On the vacuum seal, so I'm vacuum sealing the six foot, a 300 pound leader as well. Yep, it's cooled up into a little cool like that right there. And um, when you drop that bait down, is it still like a little frozen or you definitely want it thawing on the way out so that it's not frozen at all by the time you drop it? You definitely want it, you know, thawed all the way out, just like a ballyhoo when you're while you're fishing, you want to have that thing with its maximum capacity of action. Um, so get it all the way thawed out. And uh, depending on what bait you're fishing, it may take a few more minutes than another. Um, dolphin bellies, all of them are pretty quick. Dolphin bellies may take the longest just because they're a little bit, little bit meatier, a little bit thicker. Um, but definitely want to thaw the bait. That, that makes a big difference. You can't send it down there frozen. And in your notes, you talk about reusing a bait. So if you've done this correctly and if you do not get a pickup on your first drop, you're comfortable with sending the same, same bait down for a second drop? I am under certain circumstances. Um, so if I've caught a fish on a bait, it's 99% of the time not going back down there. That's why we carry so many with us. Um, but if you've got one that comes up, you know, that may have been beaten once or twice, you know, and you're maybe a little high on baits or you only carry two or three with you that day, absolutely send that thing back down there. I mean, it's you're fishing 300 pounds, so you're, only, you're not putting more than 18 pounds of drag on these fish unless you've really got something going on. So you're not going to... You're not going to have a leader failure. Um, so, yeah, if you don't feel like rigging eight or ten of them to take with you, just carry two or three. And if you if you get a couple bites on them, hopefully you catch a fish and you're ready to go home after that. But if not, by all means, send that thing back down there, as long as it's still swimming good. If the integrity of the bait is still there, 
you know, that's that's fantastic. That's that's the whole game. You just want your integrity of your bait to be good. And you just test it, I guess, just like any bait, just on the side of the boat, just watching it go before you drop it down. Yeah. So we'll we'll let all of our, you know, our wind on and stuff out. But right before we do that, we'll hold on to that leader just like you would a ballyhoo, you know, while you're fishing or white while you're fishing or anything. You just want to see that it has the correct action because that thing's going to zip down there so fast. If it, if it blows up halfway down there, you've just wasted an hour of your time fishing with a bait that's junk. So very important to make sure it's going to hold up. Well, man, um, I think this has been a fantastic podcast, especially with the demonstration included. I believe we're at the end of your podcast, Jackson. And so I usually send it back over to the guest, to the captain and say, why don't you wrap it up, man? Why don't you give us your final thoughts on, you know, not just swordfish, but swordfish bait presentation? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, like I said, as always, it's a pleasure to be on here with you guys. Anytime you ask me, I'm more than happy to do it. But sword fishing is, you know, something that's really new and really cool. And you'll see a thousand different ways to rig a swordfish bait. And I just hope that our little bit of tidbits here and a little bit of things that we've learned through trial and error, you know, have made it easier for you guys to be able to go try to catch one. They're, uh, they're such a cool fish, great eating. They put on a show for you. And it's uh, really something that's near and dear to my heart. So hopefully we can pass just a, a little bit of that along to somebody else that wants to go out there and catch one. And everything you showed us today, people can buy at Intercoastal Angler. Absolutely. Not trying to plug myself, but yes, that's, uh, you can buy everything uh, at the shop right there with us. So, Man, you're, you're giving us your time. You're giving us your expertise. You're allowed to plug Intercoastal Angler. In my mind, that was part of this deal. And you put in regular hours at Intercoastal so someone could come in and, and actually talk to the guy who was the podcast guest. For sure. I'm there. You're more than welcome to come by. I'll show you and you know all this stuff show you all the ins and outs of it and we can heck we can even rig another one right there together so feel free anybody's welcome to stop by and then finally as you shared with me at the beginning of the show intercoastal angler also offers some charter and now some offshore charter and is that correct we do yeah absolutely so anybody that's in town or even a local that wants to go um we do the whole deal half day three quarter day full day um, and we'll run a couple sword trips if you want to go and do that too. Uh, long as the weather's permitting, it's a long ride. Uh, but yeah, no, we're full service, man. Anything you need, call us at the shop. Be glad to help you out. Well, Jackson, David, man, I can't imagine you don't get calls. I can't imagine you don't get stopped by us, man. This was a very demonstrative podcast and I'm stoked. I'm, I love what we just saw. Well, cool, man. Thank y'all so much. It means a lot that y'all let me on here to uh, show you a little bit about it. All right, Jackson, we'll stay in touch, man. Okay, thank you, Gary. Billy Thorpe, what you ready up? to bake a cake? Oh, my gosh, dude. That that was um, – he made Grandma proud, stitching that thing <laughs> up. Like, I mean, I'm sitting here like, okay, this is this is the real deal, man. Like, this is looking yummy. Like, I was like, I'm going to eat that thing. So, I, man, you know, when you say, like, what is my best takeaway of the whole show – I mean, it's the whole show. Like, I don't know how I could even pick one part of that thing out because it's, I mean, just the whole rigging set up, sewing that thing up, stitching it up like a football. I'm like, all right, man, that thing is, you know, even, you know, I guess, okay, I'll, I'll do one takeaway. I won't cop out and say the whole show. The, the thread through the head of the skirt to keep that all one piece, I thought that was genius because I'm, I'm wondering how many guys are out there where that thing is, you know, 50 feet up the, up the line and they're like yeah this isn't working what's going on so i thought that was pretty good and he said it multiple times so i was like okay it's important yeah when you're dropping a bait that deep there's any number of ways that stuff can go wrong and when you go that far burn that much gas and are chasing that exciting of a fish you don't want anything to go wrong because it is a huge investment both time yeah. money and energy and so all those little details add up every single one of them yeah, man. I mean, that it was a cooking show. He showed us his yeah. ingredients. He showed us how to start. He already flashed fast forwarded to like the dish closer to completion and then <laughs> served it up, man. It was yeah. great. Yeah, Good for him. Yeah, man. He's uh, Martha Stewart of the fishing world. Like, you crushed it. <laughs> so it was man, good. That's like a how for us. Like, <laughs> now when someone wants to do rigging, we'll be like, well, watch Jackson Davis podcast. Thanks. If you can do that, yeah. then we're on board. Yeah, man, he set the standard for sure. Well, dude, and I think that's the important thing for people who are watching or listening to the show is like, 
you know, whatever. I mean, call me a pitch guy, whatever. All I feel like I do is pitch sponsors. But go support Intercoastal Angler, man. Like, he literally just broke it down for me. He probably saved hundreds of hours for some of you guys who are out here on the boat. Uh, but more than that, go go fish with him. Him and Ben will take you out there and do all the work for you. Let them sew it up. Use their gear. That's what I say. But Yeah, man. I mean, there's more than more than Jackson out there, you know, talking about it on a podcast or some other delivery method like this. But man, you know, to go into the shop, the guy will do yeah. a bait with you. Like, what kind yeah. of offers that, man? If this is on your list, especially with the holidays coming up, then treat yourself. You, you don't necessarily need more stuff. You need an experience. You need a challenge. You need a new sport, pastime, whatever you're going to call it. Let Jackson David jumpstart Swordfish as your 2023 goal. Yeah, man. It's awesome. Well, we want to thank our sponsor, Marine Warehouse Center, for making this possible. So go fish with Jackson, get the bur- the bug, and then go buy a boat and, you know, do the thing. It's a, pr- it's a process. We're just selling you the whole process of becoming addicted to fishing. <laughs> so that's why I turned down all these fishing trips with you, Gary, because I know what's going to happen. My wife's going to leave me because I'm like, I just want to fish and buy a boat. <laughs> so, anyway, man, it's been fun, Gary. Appreciate it. And we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah,